You know, it's great, it's great to be here, um, and particularly to give this talk. Uh, Ellen and I talked about uh, uh, this talk when I was RSS president, um, and when I chose as my presidential theme, statistics making an impact. And in that, uh, in, my, in my president's lecture, I drew on a number of kind of historical moments for statistics, and we thought it'd be good to elaborate in this section um, some of those, and also bring it a bit up to date with some things in, in modern history and make it a bit global. Look around the world at um, instances, um, particularly instances where this um, amazing combination of politics and statistics can be quite incendiary. Um, incendiary in a magic wizard sense and wonderful things happening, but also incendiary in a things going off bang and not such nice things happening, um, and really to use it as an illustration of why statistics matters, why this society matters, and why the fact we all care about this institution and come to a lecture like this um, is an opportunity to um, remember that the discipline of statistics is something vitally important in our societies that really needs to be nurtured and cherished um, and built, particularly at this current time. And there are many lessons of, histories that, um, lessons of history that will help us. Um, get that strength to tackle the challenges in the future. So I'm going to start with some case studies that um, were brought out at a recent meeting of the International Association of Official Statistics, where the idea was to host a day where stories from around the world would come together and we would think about what that meant for mediating this um, boundary between statistics and politics because often we are at our most useful when we are in the space of the big decisions in front of our countries. But also that's the moment when we're most vulnerable because inevitably we are challenging in some way a received wisdom or a status quo. And powerful people are not always happy when that happens. So the first case study that we had at this meeting was the case study of Andreas Georgiou in Greece. And the society has been very active in um, bringing his, his, um, his case to attention. And indeed, at this meeting, um, the statistical societies from around the world presented him with a special award. And I represented the RSS in that, but along with the ISI and the ASA and some others to really recognise um, how he has stood up for statistical um, integrity, even in the face of some really serious personal threats to himself. So the story of Andreas is um, very much linked to the story of statistics in Greece. So in the period 2004 to 2007, there were serious concerns about um, the way in which the level of um, the national debt and the deficit <coughs> of the Greek government was being reported. And many reports coming out from the European Commission that this was not correct, it was understated. And trust in the figures was really going down most week by week. And both the Greek government and the European Commission concluded something should be done, and the something that should be done is to invite someone of integrity to take charge of producing the statistics and validating that they were correct. And the person they chose and invited was Andreas Georgiou. And he went into Elstat and he did include did indeed conclude that the figures were not as they should be, and he revised them. They showed a worse picture. And at that point, the Greek economy really did get to the stage where the Greek bailout came. The impact of austerity on the people of Greece became most apparent. And Andreas, for want of a better word, became something of a scapegoat because the numbers had demonstrated the scale of the difficulty, and he was the man responsible for producing the numbers. And he has been pursued in multiple court cases, some of which are still going on. He was at the meeting and he described what it was like to be him, and um, he was remarkably phlegmatic in his description and very straightforward about it. But the personal cost to him has been enormous. And those cases are extremely serious cases, and if he is ultimately convicted, the consequences for him will be terrible. 
But interestingly, the numbers that he produced are still the official numbers of Greece. They have not been challenged or changed. Indeed, they have been validated by Eurostat. They are seen to present a true and fair picture. But in this case, this combination of statistics and politics is one where it's very hard to navigate where it is that statistics matter and where it's politics really causing, calling the shots. And I do not know very much about the Greek judicial system and I do not want to comment on it. I certainly don't want to be seen to criticise it in any way. All I observe is that someone brought in as a well-respected statistician to improve the numbers, came in and improved the numbers, and as a direct consequence of that, his life has been changed and has been pursued through the courts. And that's not a happy story. The second story that we heard um, in this meeting was the story of um, uh, Jorge Todesca. Now, he is um, an extraordinary distinguished academic who was brought into the statistical service of Argentina, INDEC. And in some ways, there is a similarity here. That over many years, the statistics of Argentina had been seen to be falsified. Bad things had happened to the staff working in the statistical system. And the outcome of that was the International Monetary Fund issued a note of censure, which suddenly started to have an impact on the ability of the Greek state to finance its debt or deal with the broader international community. And Jorge was brought in in 2015 to clean things up. And his story, again, is extraordinary of how he has had to rebuild an institution that has the technical competence to calculate statistics well and has the institutional strength to get those findings out and understood and used in the society and in politics, even when, and particularly when, they are uncomfortable for the government. And the energy and commitment and courage that he has shown in doing that is absolutely extraordinary and exemplary, and I salute him. The third example is the example of Anar Meshambayeva, who was my counterpart in Kazakhstan. And those of you who have received the most recent edition of Significance will have heard a little, about, little bit about her story. Now hers is a little bit harder to get to the bottom of. But at the meeting in Paris, she could not come. She had been in jail and she was not able to travel. Two of her deputies had also been in jail. Um, but Petri Bayer, who was um, uh, an advisor at the UN Economic Commission for Europe and is a very well-respected um, Finnish official statistician, had been to Kazakhstan and visited and understood, and he'd also been working with the Kazakhstan Statistical Service for some years um, before all of these problems came up. And he had been very impressed with the technical quality of their work and what they were doing to build a good statistical system. But in her case, what happened was when the census came along, out of nowhere, she was accused of embezzling the funds for the census and subsequently convicted of financial crimes. But on the analysis that has been done by colleagues, the charges looked difficult to justify. And it's quite hard to know what was going on there. But whatever was going on, we have yet another case of a person who is respected as a person of integrity in the field of official statistics and as a direct consequence of doing their job has found, in her case, found themselves to be in prison. And these are all examples of this incendiary combination and all examples of where it's critical for us to, first of all, stand up, but also think hard how we build an environment where those bad things just are really unlikely to happen. Because it matters that they don't. So why do stories like this exist? And that's where going right the way back into history and thinking, so what is this thing called statistics? Why has it got this potential? 
And I mean, I'll start my story this time with the census and the word census. The word census is the job of the person in the Roman Empire called the censor. And the censor had three roles. He did collect the census, kind of more or less as we know it, and we kind of know from the Bible what that meant, and um, people had to record themselves in the book. But the censor also had the job of the registration of citizens, um, which actually, incidentally, until recently, was also the job of my office when we had the General Register Office in registered births, marriages and deaths. But the third job of the censor was to supervise the moral conduct of the people. Now, in the Roman thinking, these things went together. The role of the censor was kind of integral to some of these core activities of the state. They enabled the state to function. And then you come to the word statistics. And the root of the word statistics is status, the state, in Latin. And you trace its etymology. It comes into Italian through statista, which is one skilled in statecraft. And eventually pops up as statistik in German, which is the body of information needed to allow a state or a community to function. So the very essence of our discipline isn't really about calculation. It's about the calculations necessary to help <coughs> these things to happen. It is about politics. I find that quite interesting, but it also makes some of these other things not so surprising. And you think of some of the earlier statistical collections, I think in the, in the British case, the Doomsday Book is probably the iconic one. So why was that numerical collection done? It was to help establish and entrench the power of the Norman invaders. They could find out where the wealth was. They could work out how to tax it. And through most of history, it's about trying to find out how to raise an army. Where are the, where are the men we can get to come into the army? Who's got the, the wealth that we can tax? <coughs> Usually often also to raise an army. Um, but it's all about entrenching the power of the powerful. And the idea is about that idea, that, 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 that that requirement of the ruler to be able to know what's going on in order to keep control. Now the switch of statistics into the kind of thing that we recognise and cherish today came about with the Enlightenment, with the French Revolution, with the American War of Independence, and very specifically with a man called John Sinclair, who in and around 1787 was travelling in Germany and came across the German word Statistik, came back across to Scotland where he lived and declared, I've discovered this wonderful thing called statistics in Germany. I think we could have some of that round here because I think it will improve the quantum of happiness of the people, is my favourite John Sinclair quote. Um, John Sinclair went on to be one of the founding members of the RSS and that concept of statistics as supportive of well-being and supportive of the people is very much the foundation stone of our society. And some of our early foundation stories are about the connections of people who kind of care about improving the happiness of the people by using the discipline of number. And Florence Nightingale, I guess, is the best iconic story from the early days of the society as our first woman member who worked very closely with William Farr, one of my predecessors, um, in looking at understanding mortality and getting good statistics on mortality to help create our modern health service. It's great we've got a good health contingent in here this evening because I think that is um, a really iconic symbol of the kind of transition of where power lies. So power lies not just in the autocrat who is the emperor or the king. In the Enlightenment thinking power can lie much more with the people and the representatives of the people. So statistics follows the way power has changed. And our stories going forward kind of echo that to the foundation story for my position is of Winston Churchill in 1940, being faced with conflicting views of reality whilst he's trying to make really difficult decisions about the war effort. And he willed my post into being by saying the utmost confusion is caused when people argue on different numbers. I need to have someone who can bring together 
a body of information that will be accepted and used without question. And that fundamentally remains my purpose today, to think about how we bring together people who are able to synthesise the statistics about the population and the economy of the country into a body of evidence that we, also, we, we can all accept as useful for decision making. Moving forward a bit, the next moment um, in history that I think is particularly relevant to the discussion that we are facing today as societies is 1989, when again there is a really interesting confluence between the world of number and the world of politics. 1989, the year when the Berlin Wall comes down, an idea of reinvigoration in politics, the idea of democratisation writ large, of citizen power, flowering briefly in some countries, more enduringly in others. But certainly in terms of the shift of, uh, of democracy eastwards in Europe, absolutely transformative. But a brilliant coincidence that that is also the year when Tim Berners-Lee is working on the World Wide Web, the internet, and creating um, a mechanism by which data can be generated, transmitted, shared, and used to create new forms of power through statistics. So some of the debates we're facing today are the direct follow through of that confluence. The ability of people, whether they are benign in terms of spreading power, or not so benign in terms of concentrating power, to mobilise vast quantities of number, turn them into statistical insights, and then exert power either over the people or for the people. And the challenge for us, I think, as a community, is to make sure that democratisation process really does follow through. And if I think how that works in, in my world, um, the story post-1989 is immediately picked up by John Major's government, which in 1992 um, picked up this theme of citizens' power in something, I don't know how many people remember it, called the Citizens' Charter. And the first time the British government had really used the term open government as a different way of doing things. And central to the Citizens' Charter <coughs> was a much stronger role for official statistics as providing a window on the work of government and a mechanism by which the citizen can hold the government to account. And a real emphasis in trying to think about things we now take for granted, like better information about schools, better information about hospitals. It may not always be great, but it was that process started in 1989 that has opened up some of these things that we now use in everyday life and successfully, uh, successively try to improve. However, John Major was building on slightly soft sand because his predecessor in government had really been much less anxious to build statistics. And Margaret Thatcher had really refocused the mission of the official statistics service um, much more towards the business of government and less towards the broader citizen interest. And whether that's what she intended or not, that was undoubtedly the consequence. So it became something that the Labour Party then picked up that need to be much stronger bulwarks against governments of whatever form, having the ability to decide what is the information the country can know about itself. And Jack Straw was a particularly strong advocate, and of course Jack Straw, a very proud member of, of this society, um, really spearheaded the push for independence for official statistics, which is quite strongly entrenched in many other countries, but we were almost the last country in the world to have a Statistics Act. But through initially the initiative of um, Tony Blair in his very first days in government, part of his constitutional reform agenda, which included devolution, reform of parliament, the Mayor of London, freedom of information, and independent official statistics, were all part of the same package. So it's actually seen in making the state stronger and that then finally came, came to pass in, in Gordon Brown's Prime Ministership in, in the Statistics and Registration Service Act, um, 
which came into being 10 years ago this year, and so we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. We have one of our board members, David Hand, also a former president of this society, here, here this evening. Um, and it's been a good chance for us to reflect on our short history and how that history positions itself in the kind of broader world of statistics and politics. And I think we've done something good. It's still evolving. We have created the idea that statistics is not the property of ministers. We have a statistics board whose sole purpose is to guarantee the integrity of the statistical system. We have a statutory statistics regulator whose job it is both to um, assure the quality of the official statistics that come out, but also to call to account those who are using statistics, not as well as they might be. There's been a recent case with the Secretary of State for Education on um, funding going into schools. And that voice, I think, is becoming clearer. We can still build it. But alongside that, the statutory nature of my role, which is to develop that body of official statistics that serves the public good. And it's not much more defined than that. But it kind of entrenches, in a legal basis, the value of statistics in democratic society. And we all need to worry and care that that is sustained. Because it is always under threat. And I don't want to talk for too much longer, actually, because I think um, I'd like to get a discussion going. Because I don't think it's clear where we go next. Because the generation of um, information, which is very hard to check, is pretty much unchecked and untrammeled the way in which people interpret and understand that information is very difficult to make sense of. And David Spiegelhalter in his presidency has been doing a lot of work just to think about the psychology, about how people receive facts. It's often counterintuitive. And I think I'll stop just by saying four things that I think we need to do, because I think there is an absolute imperative for the work of this society and the work of my colleagues in official statistics to see ourselves as part of a community championing a much better way of making choices that affect our, our lives. The first one is to really emphasise that official statistics, in fact statistics as a whole, are an essential part of a functioning democracy. You cannot have a valid public discourse if people don't understand the basic information about the economy or the population, or even if they have wildly different views about those things. And we see so many debates where people are in bubbles and the conversation just completely misses because there is no common language, common understanding of the reality that's being discussed. <coughs> and many people talk of the basic human right to be informed. How can you be a citizen if you don't have decent information? How can you make choices if you don't know what's going on? So we should champion that idea. The second thing is that we should be prepared to stand up and support each other even if we don't always get it right. Um, because you don't always get it right, statistics is always the, the, the business of uncertainty and error, um, and of course human frailty. But people who are trying to do the right thing, who've got this idea of getting statistics to count and make an impact, for us to stand up for them and stand up against those who are trying to corrode the currency by either using numbers in a way that is um, wrong, inappropriate, simply a prop, simply made up even, or even those amongst our own community who are not taking the task seriously. And we see so many 
research reports coming out from often quite reputable organisations that are seeking a sensationalist headline. The bacon sandwiches kill you type headlines. That then get undifferentiated between some of those things that do matter. Studies that give you no context, give you no way of realising whether this is something you should care about or not. That cheapen everything we're talking about. So we need to uphold, I mean, much less tolerant when that kind of thing is going on. The third thing that I think we need to do is make it a much more serious campaign to educate, particularly our children, but everybody, that you cannot actually be effective in society unless you have a facility with number. We had the Get Stats campaign in, in the society many years ago and um, some of the uh, analysis that we did of people's attitudes towards maths and numbers were and still are quite shocking. The fact that so many parents are actually quite proud of the fact their children don't get maths because we never did either. They would never ever say that about reading. And yet in a world where numbers are everywhere, people who have not just a, a, a lack of facility but an active disdain for, for numbers really are just not going to succeed and a vital part of our education of children and everybody must be to use numbers and evidence better and be able to make better judgments about risk to see information mathematical statistical information as a resource that will give you more power in your life. And there are so many examples of where people who have got that make good choices and people who don't. Choices in healthcare are a particularly strong example. Where a doctor who doesn't really get, get statistics can present something in a way that actively tempts the patient to reach a conclusion which is the opposite of what a true <coughs> judgment of risk would suggest. These aren't bad people. They're just people who've never been taught an appreciation of using numbers better. So the third thing is we must really push on that. And the fourth and final one is that we should see ourselves as a community that are passionate about evidence. We should make links with many others in other scientific disciplines. Because this is a common endeavour. This is seeing science as part of progress and seeing that we will only make progress if we understand our world better. Not just through statistics, but a better understanding of how the environment works. How the world works. How economies work. Ignorance is not a good way to prosper. Science is not the only answer, but unless we invest in it and make common cause with our, our friends and colleagues in other disciplines, we'll be missing something and we're much more likely to be outwitted by those who are seeking a populist agenda or an agenda that's much more about a particular vested interest. We'll certainly be playing into the hands of those who do not have a belief in democracy, a belief in human rights and a belief in the potential of each individual. And to use the language of the United Nations, which is trying to make a cause of this across the world, we will stand no chance of meeting the goal that all of our political leaders have set out, that by 2030, no one on the planet will be left behind. Let us make common cause, make that happen. Let us lose these les use these lessons of history. And then I think we really will feel that our discipline of statistics is making the impact that it should. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> questions, discussion? Helen. I'm just wondering about the concept of fake news. Uh, it's not just in America, it's here too. Aaron Banks made a statement a few days ago that the child was about 13 years old. What sort of role do statisticians have in trying to untangle 
Absolutely. Um, I think probably my main answer is to be savvy about it and to understand where people are coming from. And I think um, some of the reflections that I have on the statistics that I produce is that we do not produce our own numbers in a language that's likely to resonate with people. We don't create statistical <coughs> narratives that actually resonate with the experience that other people have. And some others who are kind of labelled in this fake news box, they do that very well. And I think we need to engage, and I think this is where David Spiegelhalter has got it right, engage with psychology. And people's psychology is, is often not um, uh, immediately enrolled by a rational argument. It's the Daniel Kahneman thinking fast, thinking slow. It's only on a good day we've actually got time to rationally analyse something it's an appeal to our emotions that actually connects with some feeling that we already have, we are likely to accept. If it's a finding that resonates with our existing view of the world, we're likely to accept it. Um, we need to kind of get into that mindset and think, how is it that we can connect our findings with the reality of the individual? Um, now, OK, that's, that's an easy thing to say, and it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to, to do, and some people are very well funded and they're very well motivated to create a particular narrative, and I don't expect this is going to kind of change overnight. And I'd, actually, I don't think it'll ever change, because my, my stories of history is it's always been thus. I think that's, perhaps that's probably the most important thing to say, that um, uh, powerful people have always been able to assert things and have actually, with a particular narrative, been able to get large numbers of people behind them. And populist narratives across thousands of years have used numbers, have used um, uh, claims in ways that are not supported and have been um, nonetheless accepted. So I think we need to be good at our jobs, it's probably number one. And number two, I think, is this issue of education, to create scepticism amongst people. So why, where is this claim coming from? Why is this person saying this to me? What's their skin in this particular game? The advantage of us, the holsters, we rarely have skin in any game other than a calculation which is actually relevant to the question we're seeking to understand. So we have a unique offering to people because why would we be trying to tell someone something that is not correct? Whereas a particular politician or a business person, um, they're always going to be slightly well, there's a question you can ask about their motivation. And I think we need to be much better at um, helping people ask that basic question. Why is this person telling me this? Why should I believe this? Where has this number come from? And Will Moy and Full Fact, fact-checking organisations, I think, are doing a good job. Reality checks on many TV stations, many newspapers have these kinds of things in there. We can make common cause with others who care about this stuff too. Um, but see it as part of our job. Lots of different things. But twas ever thus, I suppose, is what I'd say. So um, fake news isn't new. Um, but the death of real news is not true either. So do you want to organise oh, this, John? Okay. Yes, there's lots of hands. You, you're in charge. <laughs> OK. Statistics are obviously there for the good of the people and the state. And to divide the good amongst all people, or the few. But what will we do in a time where big data and statistics become more and more property of big companies? And what where can we do to still keep it for the people? Um, clearly, there are lots of examples where um, the the data that large companies have been able to accumulate uh, has become something. It's, been, it's the entire value of many companies, Facebook and Google and many of these other countries. Their whole business model is about accumulating data so that they can create more revenue for their, for their shareholders and their, their business. Uh, and I think, again, I would rest on the fact we just need to recognise that. That is business, that's fine, and I think we should 
regulate some of those spaces with a certain amount of care because there could be all sorts of unintended consequences. But at the same time, where there are sources of information that could be useful for the public good, we should seek to use them for that purpose. Um, and the uh, Digital Economy Act that was passed last year exp expressly recognises that, that if there are public or private sector data sources that could be used to create a better insight into these public policy questions, then we should do that. So this is an active line of, of, of work that um, my office is pursuing with, with many others at the moment to ensure that kind of data is available, not just for official statistics, but for broader research in the public interest. So that way you, you potentially get both, both of them. You recognise, well, data is an engine of innovation, growth, um, and, and, um, and revenue creation in private hands, and that's a good thing. But equally, um, it shouldn't be at the expense of something that is serving the broader public interest. But it's, 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 when I said I'm not quite sure what happens next, there's been quite a lot of strength on that private sector side because it's driven by some very strong interest and some very successful business models. Um, and we need to get organised to make sure that we are at least providing a sensible counterweight to that. <coughs> yeah, I was just uh, getting back to the sort of fake news or uh, that sort of area. And I think there is progress being made in holding ministers to account and that sort of thing which wasn't happening a few years ago. I don't know whether there is a, a scope for promoting the idea of the trusted sources of information because people are bombarded more. As you say, it's not a new thing, but they are bombarded more. They can see things on Facebook, on Twitter. And my first question always is, well, where's that come from? Mm. <laughs> you were saying, who's, who's produced that? And uh, I don't know whether there's an education to people about trusted sources, about where things come from. But maybe even in schools to sort of educate children to say, when you're looking at statistics, see where they come from, see who's produced them in the first place. No, I, I think that, I, I think absolutely. I think part of this um, idea of of uh, helping people learn how to be sceptical is, yeah. is is learning uh, how you ask good questions. But the 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 thing is a bit more nuanced than that. I mean, trusted by whom and for what? Yeah. And I think with the whole concept of trustworthiness in the sort of discourse that Anora O'Neill puts up is, is it's, it's very situational. Um, particular people can be trusted to do particular so sorts of information, but not others. But I think there is a much richer ecosystem developing of sources you can trust for different things. I've mentioned full fact, organisations like which would be another, another one. But other people will trust a social media site that is something that really recognises their interests. Um, and I think for uh, those, those um, types of much more fluid organisations to see they are serving their own communities better if they have a reputation for producing information that is, is, uh, is uh, uh, respectable in this sense. But then it becomes much tougher, doesn't it? Because a lot of the, those organisations are actually set around a particular idea. Um, and particularly some of the, the, the modern social media news type organisations, they are by design selective and they by design exclude different viewpoints and often people are not living in a space where they see viewpoints that, that, that conflict. I mean the old world where um, everyone would sit and tune into the nine o'clock news on the BBC every night is a long way away. So we each actually see different portions of reality um, and there are very few places where you bring it together. So wh whilst I agree with your general proposition, making it reality is tricky, apart from teaching a pretty general scepticism um, and an ability to challenge and just ask these questions. When I see this, um, what are the triggers? Is this something that should make me, make me alarmed or make me reassured? Well, well, thank you so much for so many good points, John. In fact, that prompts me to ask a question around the post-Brexit environment. How do you see the role of uh, statisticians uh, in the future, the next five years at least, in terms of the, the burdens they will have, responsibilities, accountabilities, and the obligations that we have now with the EU, we may not have in the same way. And on the other hand, we'll have newer obligations with the rest of the world that we don't know about yet. So, 
how will we cope with that and what should we keep in mind at this point in time so that we are still continue doing the good work that we all want to do? Um, I have two, two things I'll say to that. I, the, the first thing is that to understand how well the country or not the country is doing in the next few years, it's going to be absolutely essential we have a good understanding of um, information about Britain alongside information about France and Germany and the US and Canada. So comparability of information is going to be even more at a premium than it might have been before. So it's, it's essential we keep well connected to our international networks, well connected to international standards um, and really take care to ensure that information about this country is consistent with information about other countries. Uh, the second answer is then to think about those things that might change where we really will need to spot what's happening quite quickly if we're to make corrections. So, I mean, the two areas that are standout areas for me at the moment are trade and immigration. So, um, what is happening to, so to, to people who are currently staffing the health service or the construction industry or whatever it is? Um, where are they coming from? Are we going to have enough? Um, and understanding immigration through that lens, not just kind of macro, what's the total number coming in, but something that actually helps you really make important choices about the functioning of different services. Um, and trade, obviously, thinking, so what is actually going to happen to the balance of trade between some of our European neighbours and some other parts of the world where the government has particular ambitions, but we will need to be able to understand that, or they will need to understand it, but others who have got different political views will also want to understand it so they can challenge it. So those are really my two answers. International comparability becomes really important and their ability to have something useful to say in those areas where Brexit is most likely to have an impact really needs serious attention from all of us. Um, I want to go back to trusted information. Um, there was a sub-headline on the Times about um, two or three weeks ago which announced that the discovery of a Greek, ancient Greek ship at the bottom of the Black Sea, two kilometers deep, which had been dated by some <coughs> submarines going from Bradley to be uh, 2,400 years old. Mm -hmm. And this ship was in com complete, within mm -hmm. its rig rigging. Now, it seems to me that this is a tremendous piece of news. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen very often. And it did get on the front page of the Times, but as a sub uh, heading. The main heading was uh, people who eat organic food are 30% less likely to catch cancer. And this was a study done on several hundred thousand people, I think, in France. Mm -hmm. We all know why that is wrong, but it was still a headline, the main headline on the Times. Yeah, I, um, another lesson for me from our statistical literacy campaign is most people don't like to be made to look stupid. And I think that... Um, opportunities to build a community of people who, can, who know what good looks like and are prepared to have a bit of fun with their peers are like gold dust. So the RSS Awards for Statistical Journalism are really good and the people that have won that are the best people to go along to their colleagues. So I'm fairly certain the Times has won it a couple of times and I wouldn't mind betting that some of the journalists that have been on that side of the argument might have gone down the corridor to their colleagues saying, what were you doing? That was ridiculous. And just finding those things that will create an incentive for people to get things right. And gradually, gradually, we will shift that balance. But some of these stories are just too tempting. Anything to do with health, however extraordinary, seems to get a top headline, even in otherwise respectable newspapers. Um, so if we can build scepticism in the general public, but I think this peer-to-peer -peer thing is really powerful. We did quite a lot of work with journalism in the RSS, we did quite a lot of work with politicians. Um, we have been doing, I think, some work more recently with um, heads of charities. Um, so get a kind of peer network of people who really get this stuff and use them as a kind of force that can help educate um, or even ridicule 
those that are kind of less quick to, to appreciate the value of a good story that's based on something um, solid evidence rather than a cheap story that's based on something made up. Um, I want to go back, perhaps taking your 1989 example, but to raise the issue of resources for statistics and people's concern about having numbers collected from them or about them. <clears throat> I went and gave a um, talk in Estonia about our Europeristat project, mm -hmm. and my, my host said, um, yes, in Estonia we set our birth registry up just at the right time, the moment the Soviets left and before all the new restrictions. <laughs> and they can't introduce cancer registration because that's not acceptable because of the fear of numbers. And again, and the other thing is resources. An East German contact who came to see where I worked before and after the war came down. And afterwards he said, well, um, before the war came down, um, we had lots of statistics, but we weren't allowed to publish them. Mm. Um, now we can publish whatever we'd like, but they've dismantled our statistical systems. Mm. And that was certainly that case in a number of East European countries we had contact. Um, certainly the birth statistics system in Hungary, which was um, actually very good in, mm. for whatever reasons in, um, in the pre-89 era, has been, has been dismantled and no, data are no longer collected. So. Um, uh, there is so resources, the fear of having data collected, and that was obviously exemplified here in the whole um, issue of the care.data mm. um, system and the, and the national opt-out website. Mm. Uh, NHS Digital doesn't say, have a website saying, you know, if you've been left out, we're collecting wonderful statistics, this is what you mean for you, you can join in again. It's about how to opt out. Hmm. Um, if you object to being, having, having your data used for research or planning, but one of the things I've been taking up, I'm ex there's a ex fear of data being used for commercial purposes. There's no mention of how people can opt out of having their data used for commercial purposes. It may be the, um, uh, uh, the activities of commercial activities, companies like Dr. Foster's hmm. are, seem to be planning. Um, I think it's whizzing up, whizzing around NHS data and selling it back to the NHS mm. as a markup. Mm. That maybe you could see. But um, there, there um, people's fears about uh, their data being sold um, and uh, a lot of misinformation being put, put around, some, some of it by people who should know better. Mm. Well, I think it, it, it will be an ongoing yeah. challenge and I, I think we have to expect bumps on the road, um, but just be determined that we do the best we can. I mean, one of the, the heartening stories in Argentina, even in the, the darkest days, with no resources at all, a group of academics tried to replicate what true indices of, of prices would look like reasonably successfully. And I think the one thing we have on our side is a passion to do this well. And that doesn't cost money and can overcome any of these barriers. But boy, would it be easier if we didn't have those barriers, of course. Um, but I think what we have on our side is that, is that kind of um, passion for our discipline. And we would do whatever we possibly can, even in the most adverse of, of circumstances. But the more we club together with others, the stronger the collective case will be and the greater the likelihood is that we will get to a better space on health data. I think some of the statements that Matt Hancock's made since he's been Secretary of State suggest that he is wanting to do something which is is much more creative but he's navigating a political landscape too um, and uh, the more we can do to support people who are trying to go in that direction the better um, and um, the more we can do to demonstrate that without it our public discourse is the poorer again also the better. So your Argentina story reminds me of um, <coughs> I think it's late 70s early 80s when <coughs> people were disappearing in Argentina and um, there was an ISI meeting and debate about whether people should go given that Argentina had quote mislaid the head of its statistical service. Well he's still on the list of the missing yeah. from 1977. Yeah. Mm. So obviously, obviously the, uh, from the positive side the, the fact that Perhaps people are fear, frightened about 
numbers, but on the other hand, the fact that the power of correct numbers may be frightening the people who need to be frightened. Well, yes, and that's where the incendiary combination <coughs> comes in. Uh, there's also just a recent reading of Marianne Mazzucato's latest book, uh, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking the Global Economy. Mm -hmm. She raised some very important points about sort of there's a neoclassical argument that we should have a smaller government. And she's arguing that part of the problem here is we're actually just not really measuring the value of what the government provides. So, for example, if the government spends a lot of money on teachers, that's just market taxes and government and big government is spending money on teachers, but we're just literally not counting the value of the education we receive because it is given to us for free. Do you think there's a case we make for trying to put um, numbers on all the free services we get from the NHS, from the rule of law, which traditionally haven't been counted in GDP? Is this something that should be considered? Um. There's two aspects to that. So many of those things, those services we receive for free are nonetheless services and they are part of the national accounting framework and we attempt to put a number on them and they are in the tables. Um, but uh, So there is some answer there. But the more uh, pertinent answer, I think, to your question is... Uh, I mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals in the, in the UN and there was a consultation in... I think about 2012, 2013, amongst many, many tens of thousands of people around the world about what they thought we needed to measure. And traditionally, um, everyone had thought, well, the things we need to measure are kind of getting a better economy to help people get out of poverty and, and lead um, prosperous lives, doing something about society and demography and thinking about inequality and ageing and all of those things, and doing something about the environment. So this economic, social and environmental perspective and the expectation was this consultation would affirm that, but also give some pointers to which elements people cared about the most. And it did that. But it said, but you're forgetting a fourth thing, that we can't do any of this unless we live in security, if we have good institutions, if we, have, if we get rid of corruption, if we have transparency. And so goal 16 in the SDG framework is all about having institutions that are um, trustworthy, have the strength to do the jobs they're doing, can deliver a good education, a good, good health service and, and so on. Um, so that's in the framework. The trouble is that's the least defined in terms of measurement and the kind of hardest in term, and most contestable in terms of what good looks like. Um, and particularly when you're thinking about issues like corruption, um, it's not necessarily in the interests of all the current governments of the world to have real clarity and transparency and league tables on that kind of thing. But there is a group um, in the kind of UN system that's really trying to, to, to populate that database. The UK is very active in that, certainly a, a priority of our current government to, to, um, to kind of get that better understood. So the answer is you are right, we do it a bit, um, but there's certainly a, a wish for us to do it better and actually a commitment in the SDGs that we should. Um, thank you very much for a really, really interesting to think, thinking about statistics and politics. Is, I think it's really crucial. But my question is, isn't any statistic political to begin with in the sense that nothing's objective 100%, right? So we are starting, I think the main issue is that we, we, we construct definitions and we construct statistics mm. that are not. 100% objective, aren't they, to begin with? They, they resort to or they relate to someone's idea of mm. what GDP should be or inflation should be or migration should be. So isn't that actually the main problem? Uh, it is a very significant problem and certainly a significant problem for me in my office where we have lots of people who are very good statisticians and are, are trying to find the truth. But then what is truth? Uh, and I rest quite comfortably on the Churchill definition, which is a body of in information that can be accepted and used. So my test is entirely a test of utility, almost entirely a test of utility. I think technical um, merit is, is, is an important underpinning of utility. So it's something that is acceptable and helpful. And the level of acceptability can be a very high test or it can be a, quite a low test. I mean, some, some things like I mean, how many people are present in this room is a statistical calculation and we can do it with some certainty and claim it to be truth. How many people are present in the United Kingdom? Con conceptually, that, that has a meaning 
and there is a truth, there is a, there is a number of people who are currently present in the United Kingdom and you can estimate that. But most other things are a construct. Certainly anything in economics is pretty much a construct. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognise that because otherwise we're chasing the wrong problem. So for me the problem is what is that body of information that will help Britain make better decisions? And that is judged by whether people are actually using it, whether they accept it, whether they understand it. Um, and that feels a test that is within our grasp and it's not making a claim we are unable honestly to fulfil. Does that work for you? Because I'm quite interested in validating this one because that's, that's, intellectually that's, tough. that's a, a, a tough thing to bring about. No, it's because what I think about all the time when I was thinking about statistics as well. Good. Keep thinking that way. <laughs> I, I think one of the tensions in statistics is that um, your main job is to give a picture of the generality, and yet when people hear them, they want to know about what's with particularity of their own situation. Mm. Uh, I think Ethan Shaw wrote something mm. in, the FT in the FT last week, yeah. Before um, suggesting some ways, I, I mean, what, what, with the new, um, a way of presenting data and ability to disaggregate. I mean, what sort of opportunities do you see for dealing with this problem? Well, but there are opportunities to deal with this problem. I mean, Hitan made a great point in the FT, and a lot of our numbers in our presentation is about an average, which actually represents nobody, really. Um, but the opportunities of visualisation, the opportunities of much richer data sources enable us effectively to start where the individual is and then help them understand where they fit into a distribution if you're using our kinds of language. And that's much more likely to resonate. Um, and sometimes that will be, um, I know variables like income are really very easily um, connected with that idea and lots of presentations of income give you the full distribution and you can kind of see where you are and see where you, where you, where you fit and that helps you recognise the average much more um, readily if that is something interesting to you. But I think visualisation and the data sources we've now got enable us to do something which is much more salient for people. So I think you answered your own question. That's absolutely a, a very active area of, of, of what we're trying to do, is that we're not presenting people with this kind of average that um, describes no one's reality. And so in various things that we've done, with looking at um, crime maps, for example, you can look at what's happening in your street. Um, looking at um, uh, impact of inflation on particular individuals. You can put in the goods you buy and see how they compare with the goods that other people buy. There are a lot more interactive things that are much more possible, technically possible now, um, and certainly make the numbers much more interesting and useful for people. Yeah, I too enjoyed your talk, John. The, the word that you keep using which frightens me is we. And I'm not sure who the we are who are going to do all these saintly acts because, as the lady here suggested, you know, statisticians at Facebook don't care. You know, they're in it for themselves. The, uh, you know, the three stories you started with about Kazakhstan and Greece and what have you, I mean, I, yeah, sorry for the statisticians, but they were caught by despots in failing states, and it's no surprise the statisticians get it in the neck. Uh, but, you know, even in places where you would expect behaviour to be better, I mean, uh, uh, if you think about the, the, the difficulty the US Census Bureau has mm -hmm. conducting a, a census, you know, some of the stories about the management and corruptness and accuracy of figures coming out of Eurostat, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, places where there ought to be good behaviour, mm -hmm. there doesn't seem to be good behaviour. You come to the UK, I mean, you're doing a great job, but let's be honest, the LNS budget is a portion of all of government spending, I mean, you'd probably know it, but it's almost nothing, isn't it? Hmm. Within that, the proportion of it that's spent on regulation, again, is almost nothing. As a trustee of full fact, I know how terribly difficult it is to get you know, a lot of these wealthy bodies to even give a, a few thousand quid to a, a group mm. like that to do it. So I just don't really understand why government won't fund it and why civil society won't fund it. And I don't see without that that anything's going to happen. That might be a speech, not a statement, but I mean, why won't government fund it? And why, why doesn't civil society fund it? What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, 
it's, a, it, it's something that I have struggled with. It's very difficult to think what is the business model for this thing, just from a basic economic point of view. It is blindingly obvious there is a massive demand. Um, so why doesn't the, um, um, the market fulfil that demand? And we have not got a way of connecting the resources to the question. I think Alison's question about resources is, is, is relevant here. Um, and I think it connects to the age-old problem of funding infrastructure. This is part of the infrastructure of, of democracy um, and you need quite a broad coalition to come together to actually both fund it in the first place and then protect it and build it rather than allow it to, to degrade. And it's a continuing fight to make that happen. Um, so you started your question by saying, who is the we? I think we is certainly all of us in this room, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But those like us who care about these things, who think our democracy is the poorer, if we don't have this, now democracy is the richer if we do. And to really cherish people who are trying to uphold this and seek to um, call out those who are, who are doing the opposite. Um, and if we do that, we've got some fighting chance. If we don't, we really haven't. So the we actually is self-defined. Um, it's pretty much self-defined in the mission statement of the RSS. It's not just about statisticians, it's about all of us who kind of care about data, evidence and decisions in, in the world in which we live. That's the best I can do. I've been wrestling with this for a very long time. I don't, I'm just going to add one rejoinder, but I mean, a couple of people have mentioned stupid stories from academics, particularly in the health area. You know, it's almost a daily diet. But a lot of those academics will be doing research that's funded by research councils where the money comes from government. So it almost seems as if government doesn't, doesn't care. And I mean, you don't necessarily have to respond to that, but it, it really is rotten at the heart, isn't it, if you can't even expect research councils to be delivering worthwhile research with the money that they uh, give to academics on behalf of us taxpayers. Well, absolutely. I know. I, I, I don't kind of uh, hesitate from agreeing with you on that and the whole issue of publication bias generally across the, the, the way the kind of incentives within uh, academia are, are set up kind of pushes you in a direction which is um, which is the wrong way for this um, and I think again there's um, us making common cause with people like Sense About Science and others who are really kind of championing this, this, this thing and the broader alliance for useful evidence and I think the, the, the interventions that David Spiegelhalter has made using the presidency of the society to, to really make this and which really was the centrepiece of his president's lecture um, that these questionable research practices are quite often in some of otherwise or what you would expect to be very reputable institutions and funded by important um, national, national bodies and we should become much less tolerant of that. Hi, um, so um, in the modern world's changing quite quickly, there's data um, happening, all, we are strongly using data um, there's a lot of innovation going on at the moment. However, we, the, the, the statistics world is nonetheless reasonably cautious because we don't want to undermine our trustworthiness. But if we don't move quickly enough, we lose trust because we're not using all of the information available. So what should be our risk appetite? Well, one of the things that um, we did shortly after I... Uh, came into my current job, was actually do an assessment of risk appetite. And uh, the clear conclusion of our board at that time was that the biggest risk was not to be relevant. So that we should be much more open-minded and active in pursuing statistics that are useful and helpful, even at risk sometimes of getting things not as precise as we might like. That to inform a decision you have to be much quicker because otherwise the decision has been made before you've got anything on the table. You need to be much more granular because the average tells you very little. And fundamentally you need to be answering the questions that people are worried about rather than just pumping something out and according to some regular definition that you're, you're used to. So that requires you to be much more creative, much more innovative. And as soon as you're more creative and innovative, you are going to make more mistakes and fail. So there's an explicit recognition that the bigger risk is not to try. 
than occasionally to make a mistake. Which is one of the reasons I come in here and say, one of the things you can best do for me is forgive me when I screw up. Because kind of sometimes we will. Um, um, but we're trying to do something helpful and this kind of test is, is whether there is this, this utility for, for the kind of public, public <coughs> good. Um, but uh, your caricature of the system is, is not incorrect. We are inevitably um, challenged to move as fast as some of the technologies we're working with are moving. But we kind of have to, otherwise we are progressively going to get left behind. Thank you, Bajon. Um, just a quick one, sort of two points. One is the resourcing, and the other one is your two of your big priorities of immigration and trade. I mean, in light of Brexit, have you not found that there is a bigger appetite in certain parts of government for evidence and data, particularly on those two issues? And the, the chance to have a nice lovely fund to help with sort of Brexit planning, and is you know, is there a chance of perhaps getting resource from that to help, especially with those two priorities, and getting a bit more resource for them? Yes. Yeah, no, no, there, there is. I mean, there is that appetite for, there is that appetite for data, and there is a fund, and we are doing our best to get some of it. <laughs> I think most of my questions have been sort of somewhat answered, John. But um, well, the trouble with the political discourse is it always moves ahead of the, the statistical frontier, in a sense, and you always. Um, running to stand still and it's, and it's very difficult to enjoy that debate if you're clueless about the, the statistics that need to support it. So I'm wondering whether statisticians should stand up and be counted more and this relates to the risk question that was asked earlier. Give more commentary to newspapers, more punditry if you like, because other people do this all the time, economists and so on, and sometimes they do it from a a much weaker base. But I think the other point I would make is that we need to, need to be much more political, politically savvy to know where the next issues are going to come and what we can do to prepare for those mm. questions that lie ahead. And I, I, I have this strong feeling that we're always slightly behind the curve. Well, I mean, yes to that. And I think uh, horizon scanning is always the future is never what, you, what your forecast suggests it's going to be, but a, a thought process that makes you think about the questions that are likely to come up. And when you're looking at a, a near term, two to three years, some of these things aren't so hard to predict. I mean, at a very straightforward level, we have elections, there are manifestos in elections, so it's kind of not surprising that government then starts trying to have policies in some of these areas. I mean, the green strategy would be quite a good example. And you can get ahead of the curve on some of those kinds of things just by keeping your eyes open. And mm -hmm. we should certainly do that and be more savvy in the way that you've described. But the punditry thing I'm much more cautious about mm -hmm. um, because I think that one of the key reasons that we have a good measure of trust is that we're not trying to peddle a particular position. And most pundits are. They are trying to influence what you decide. I think we have to be very savvy and very clever in the way we communicate the evidence, but not take a position as to what the evidence should tell you to do. Because actually, reasonable people can... We were sorts of up about savings to the health service, and several of us could have stood up there and say, look, hang on, this is a, this is a nonsense. But was it a nonsense? You see, because each of those statements were, if X, Y and Z happens, this will follow. I mean, the Scottish independence debate was the best example of that, where the SNP and the, I can't remember what they, they were called now, but the, 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 the let's stay in, in the UK um, teams, both had the same number as to how much better off you would be if you voted that way. And they were both right. Because the SNP said, if we get in power, we will do this, this and this, and if we do that, you will be this much better off. And the other said the opposite. And they aren't necessarily... For, so it's the nature of the claims. And again, it's just it's being savvy about dissecting those claims. Now, other claims, like we've got 350 million a week to give to the NHS, well, that just didn't make any sense because that was much more of a... Uh, it, it was using a particular set of statistics in a way that those statistics did not support. And Andrew Dillnock did 
call that out. Um, and, uh, but some of the other, the other claims were just not of that nature. But it's quite hard to, to navigate because the boundary, well, it comes back to what, he, what is truth here, the boundary of what is a descriptive statistics, and dis descriptive statistic and what is um, um, a prediction of what's going to happen. I think it's about communicating your findings better as, as well. You, know, you can take a bunch of statistics and you can tell lots of, there's lots of narratives within that. And actually picking the narrative that actually feeds into the particular debate at a point in, in time can be quite um, powerful. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. I, I, I think I, I, would, I would go with you that far. I mean, there's a, um, a, a recent example. Um, it was when Dominic Raab was still housing minister rather than Secretary of State for, for exit. Uh, he had made a claim that uh, immigration was pushing up house prices. Um, and he put a kind of number around that. Um, and that was challenged. But what... Uh, we then worked with his department to do was to put out a statistical release which actually spelt out the assumptions that lay behind that claim, the data sets that helped you create that calculation and gave other people the chance to challenge it. Now that I think is the system working. He's perfectly entitled to make a claim but he's absolutely um, required to stand up and say, so where did this come from and be, be, be tested on, on that. Um, so that's quite a good example. He didn't get it quite right the first time but um, the the, the statistical teams working with him. Do you remember what the answer was? Well, uh, yes. the answer was if you, have if, you, if you have more people coming into a fixed supply, the oh. price goes up <laughs> by this, and that, that was it, really. <laughs> so, well, it's your, your world. Um, yeah. But it'd be, there's, 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 it's not very long ago. Do you remember when it was, though? Was it earlier this year or last year? Um, it's, it's quite a recent one. So okay. you, can, you, can, you can look that up and um, see and contest it yourself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. However well prepared statistics are, they can still be quote selected. Yes. And of course, the question of the different weight. Yes. Um, and of course, that's a different issue. It can still, still be very confusing, even if people do their job properly. Yeah. But they just are, though. I mean, well, I, I, that's life, I, I mean, that's life. I mean, and people do put different weights on things. And I think that's why we need to be very careful of the claim we're making. We're not saying there's one view of the, of the world which is, which is truth and therefore causes you to do this. I mean, I struggle a bit with the concept of um, evidence-based decision-making because I think for most practical purposes, people with different values, different politics, can come to different views on the same evidence. Well, um, people can go and look for the evidence. They think we'll justify their case. Oh, well, those people I'm, I'm, I have less sympathy with because I think they are deluding themselves. Doesn't everybody do that to an extent? You know? We decide somebody investigating a hypothesis thinks this looks interesting, even if they start off particularly neutral. Uh, well, I think if we're trying to protect ourselves, we try to do the opposite. I try to ask people, what have I not thought of? Yeah. rather than here's something that I've already thought of, let's do that. Yeah. And this again is, is part of training and I think it's the training that we've all had as scientists to try and think, so what's really going on here? And ask some questions around the corner and not immediately grasp the first thing that confirms the thing we thought already as being somehow proof that we were right. Therein lies ruin um, for pretty much anybody. Um, we're proving what hypotheses you should be investigating. No. But Keeping an open mind and wanting to see the alternative before um, coming to your conclusion seems like quite a good rule for a happy life. <laughs> a couple of points on the slightly different tack. The, your third sort of point at the end about the um, education, mm -hmm. I think that is just so, so important mm -hmm. to carry on with it and the Get Stats campaign that was so successful. How do we carry on with that momentum? Because it, uh, we often lose it as a sort of flavour of the month and then move on to something else. But the new generations of children coming through, new journalists coming through. Um, and so really that momentum needs to be sort of maintained and kept going. Um, but the, the, the other, th and, and it's often a resource issue, you know, so we've moved mm. to other things, other priorities. But actually the same issues then come again in a cycle after a few years. Uh, but the other thing I just wanted to mention it was the, 
I've just last six, seven weeks I've been in various other countries um, running a workshop in, uh, for Asia and Pacific countries and then Saudi Arabia and India. Mm -hmm. And what we've been talking about here and things to do that we need to do and improve on, but I'm really proud of what we do when I'm out there talking and seeing some of the things that are happening in some other countries and you know, find myself talking about how we are doing things and how we should be doing things over there, how they can improve. Mm -hmm. Because the level of um, user engagement, perception of what users should be uh, doing or how they should be sort of engaged, it just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, one example I saw last week in India was a whole book of tables, literally just table grids, mm. um, year, a year on each page rather than time series. Mm. And I just questioned, do you make these available any way interactively or online? No, we just make the PDFs available. If you make it too user friendly, people start questioning us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just that perception of, you know, we need to make these things useful to people just doesn't exist in many places. So I think what, a lot of what we're doing is actually well, I mean, I, all I can do is agree with you. I mean, the society still cares about education. It's still a key part of um, the ambition. It's still one of the roles of the vice president. Um, and it's not gone off the agenda. I mean, there's a, a uh, group that's um, chaired by Ian Diamond, uh, run out of the British Academy, that's looking at quantitative skills across the country. And it's starting at the kind of education base and then kind of building up through um, cross disciplines in, in universities and then thinking about thinking about the workplace and we had a meeting in that group only a couple of weeks ago so there is a, a coalition of people that are really caring about this but um, well I put it in my priority list because I think it's something we do need to turbocharge because it's it's urgent and we're not we've not currently got the level of um, activity that actually would deal with the problem um, so um, I know is, any, is anyone currently on Council, Simon, it's, is it something the society is actively looking at the minute? I can't recall anything coming up on mm. the last year. But you'll make sure it does at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Good. <laughs> well, the, well, the question is uh, in, around uh, what innovations we should consider uh, in the good series that we have already in official statistics. And uh, I'm just thinking aloud that uh, though we have a lot of good work, as we know, but we also know that we have got a lot of work to do around uh, reducing uh, the, I mean, inequality. Inequality. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more clear to us. And pay gaps. So there are many areas which have become very obvious, despite the good series we have. Mm -hmm. So. Are there any series we should consider now, some new series, to meet those unmet needs so that we could be working towards, I mean, I'm thinking globally, statistics for peace rather than for war, statistics for refugees, uh, humanitarian work. So do we have those things in place so that once we work towards that, then the prosperity hmm. of nation states will be much higher than they are now? Well, I mean, they... Sustainable Development Goal Framework has been designed to do that. So you've got 17 different goals that have been signed up to politically across the world. They cover the economic, social um, and environmental domains and have this element of peace and security in as well. And also, specifically to Alison's question, have the kind of means of implementation too, which includes resourcing for making these, these changes. So it's designed to be a comprehensive and universal framework. And within it, on your specific point about inequalities, there is a requirement to get disaggregated information, not just the average, but understand what this is doing for indigenous communities, older people, um, people with low incomes, whatever it is. So in different dimensions, different ethnic groups, um, uh, so that you can actually pinpoint which types of people in which societies are at most risk of being left behind or are not having the opportunities to, um, to, to, to move forward, whether it be to lack of education or sanitation or whatever else it is. So there is a framework there of measurement. There is a process in the UN to try to um, support countries get better at measurement um, we are one of the, the leading group at the moment, but there's still only about 60% of the indicators that we're able to manage. 
So it's going to be quite a long haul, but we're investing in that. We've got a, a, a platform that actually sets out what we've got and what we haven't got um, that kind of invites ideas from people. Have you got a better way of measuring something we're currently struggling with? So some of these peace and security metrics, for example. If anyone's got a great idea, put it on a postcard and um, we'll have a look at it. Um, but that's going on across, across the world and um, in many countries down to city and locality level, people are thinking, so what are the things that actually matter to us here? Is it water quality? Is it illegal mining? Is it poverty? Is it whatever it is? And so then to, so for people to own the indicators that matter to them. And I think that's just, there's something grassroots about this movement, which I think is really quite encouraging. Because if you do something that's useful, we're much more likely to be involved in it and much less likely to have some of the kind of negatives that we've talked about here. I mean, your India example is quite a good one. There's, there's just... Um, doesn't seem from the way you told the story a, a large group of people actually saying well if only we had better statistics we'd be better off because they're just not are they <laughs> as I get to choose who asks a question can I make a reflection so it, it's driven by your three examples mm -hmm. uh, the, the <coughs> cases of statisticians going to the stake for numbers those three and I thought, is there, is there something good you can say about this? And what, what I was thinking is, what you can say is good. It's a way in which the world differs now from 50 years ago, say. Uh, 50 years ago, people didn't, go to, pe people didn't go to the stake for numbers because people, the people who put the torches beneath them didn't care about numbers. So numbers have actually become much more important in the world than they were. Let's take that as a positive. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely.